little less clear to me what I'm doing. Um, both, both in this paper and kind of existentially, right? Like as, as a kind of like what I'm doing as a human being in the world. Um, and, and part of this paper, uh, I suppose the one thing I've concluded is that and, and there's, there's a deep sense in which I don't care about academia, right? Like I don't care about the, the specialist conversations between like experts in various areas of knowledge production. Um, and so I'm trying to work out what it is I'm interested in because there's something else that I'm interested in. Um, and a lot of it has to do um, with a kind of a megalomaniac war against common sense, which has driven me since my childhood. Um, and the, the kind of, the, the, the focal area of that particular war has been around violence, right? So, so uh, purportedly I'm an expert in the, in the area of violence studies. Um, but I'm not sure about that either, um, in a whole lot of ways. Um, because when I think about um, what it means to, 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 to study violence, like what is the study of violence for even, um, and what kind of problem is it trying to, to answer, um, there seem to be so many different fragments of things going on that don't coalesce nicely into the kind of linear narrative that you, one would like to present as a paper. Um, and the more I think about this presentation, the more difficult it gets to present it as a paper. And there are two different ways I was trying to conceptualize. The one is as a kind of a, as, as, as a video, because it relies on two frames simultaneously. It relies on the, the kind of intersection of two narratives and a, and, a, and a kind of a crossing point between two different narratives. And you can't really do that verbally. You can't create a simultaneous crossing point. You can only have a kind of a linear account. Um, so it's going to break down in that way. In another way, I was thinking of it more as a kind of a piece of music um, in that it's not... There's not just one thing going on. Like the, the, there's a kind of a harmonic structure going on, and the, and the different threads that interact differently, and through that interaction, they produce a kind of a, a effective kind of a, uh, impact. Um, so I'm trying to do that at the same time. So it's getting really worse and worse um, as, 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 as I kind of push into this thing. Um, and when I think about this. The story of, 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 of what, what I'm doing when I, when, I, when I try and do this violence and, um, and, and what, kind of, what kind of space it, it's trying to occupy. And I try to th think about where it started. I, I was maybe 12 years old and I grew up in a very boring place and, the only, and, and I was very poor. So the only thing you could do is go to the library and take books out. Um, but to go past, to, to go to the library, I had to go past the police station. And around the, probably 12, one of the things that sort of interrupted my happy relation to this world of fiction was hearing the screams from the police cells as I walked past the police station. Um, and it was always just hearing. There was never anything to see. There were just these people crying out. And because I... I relate to sound, I think, more than other sensory stimuli. This is the kind of thing that stayed with me, and it, kind of, it created a kind of problem I wanted to solve. Like, I, I posed to myself the question of, like, what is going on in there? Because no one's talking about it, because there's no discourse. Um, and in fact, there was specifically a denial of discourse. There was actually an entire, which I realized later, an entire state infrastructure of censorship, um, imprisonment of journalists, um, censorship of the news media, state control of the news media. So certain things couldn't be talked about. So part of what I'm trying to do in this work, I've realized, is, is to fill up a kind of a silence with something. But it's, but it's not entirely clear what that thing is. But at the same time, I've realized I'm trying to do something else 
which isn't really an academic project. Um, because the normal work of trying to describe violence is a work of sort of theoretical conceptualization. Often it's primarily a research work of understanding cause and effect relations, but then a, a, a sort of a hypothetical imagined end goal of intervening, breaking those cause and effect relationships. And that is interesting to me, um, but it seems more and more that I'm noticing that there's something else going on. Um, which has got more to do with what people in trauma studies think of as one of the things, not that they're doing, but that people are doing, is a kind of work of simply witnessing. Like there's something, there's something, in, it, it seems on a level that I don't properly understand that there's a value in simply witnessing certain things, simply being a human being who retains knowledge of those things. Um, without necessarily being able to account for them, without necessarily being able to turn them into something that can be organized as a kind of a, 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 in, in a systematic explanation. Um, and so to those of you who suffered through my talk last year, this was kind of hour-long gothic horror about Peter Dutton, right? <laughs> um, and I felt really bad about that. A, I mean, it was way too fucking long, but it was also just depressing, right? It was deliberately depressing. Um, and this is worse, okay? The only advantage of, of today is that it's much shorter, I hope. Um, but it's also, it's, 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 a, it's a kind of a heart-wrenching narrative. And there are, there is an image of a, of a, a, a the body of a person has been violently murdered in, in the slide, so you don't have to stay for that. So, what what I want to talk about? Um, I want to talk about um, two two killings that happened. Um, I want to talk about these guys on the screen here, Mlungisi Malo and Lucky Sefali, um, who were murdered. Um, on a, the 7th of September um, 2017, about a year and a half ago, kind of up the road from where I live. And it's an interesting story to me because it didn't receive much press attention. And that's understandable because in South Africa most, um, most killings don't receive much press attention. There's about 45 of them every day and maybe one or two get sort of symbolically adopted by the media as representative of something. And these were not seen as representative of anything. Um, so they disappeared. These deaths kind of disappeared into a just business as usual. And so what I want to do is I want to, to, I want to retrieve them. And I'm aware that in trying to retrieve them, I'm trying to do two things. And um, the one is that thing that I was talking about, is that, that I just want to retrieve them into the space of us acknowledging what happened. But then I also want to retrieve them in a much more specific kind of intellectual way um, to, as, 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 as a framework for talking about violence in South Africa. And, and it's a hugely problematic thing because I know one of the thing that's, things that goes on when I present this kind of work to this kind of audience is it plays into an imaginary of Africa, which this incident necessarily plays into. It plays into a, a kind of a... I don't really want to discuss, but you'll see why it plays into an, an imaginary of the kind of lost continent, the place of darkness and savagery, all of that. Um, but I want, I want to try and pull it out of that and do something else with it. Okay, so Mlungisi and, and Lucky. Um, I'm going to tell you three stories. It's kind of two, one story and it's a story with two parts. Um, um, and this is where you've got to imagine the the split screen and the intersection of these two narratives. Okay. So this, the 5th of September 2017, it's 5 o'clock in the afternoon, people are going home from work through this major transport hub in Pine Town, which is close to where I used to live. Um, and a guy, um, and his son and his best friend, Bukisa Ole, um, are stopping at this transport hub because his autistic son is um, getting quite distressed. And so what he wants to do is um, to stop and get some, something to eat and drink for his son. 
So he gets out of the car, he leaves his son with his best friend, and he rushes into the little shop to, to grab some provisions. Okay. At the same time, there's another scene happening. Is a group of commuters, and this is, you can imagine, a very, very big crowded space, dense with people, tired people on their way home from work. Um, they see a child screaming, trying to get out of a vehicle, and a man trying to stop the child getting out of the vehicle. As the crowd gathers and starts trying to work out what to do, someone says that they saw a girl being bound and forced into the boot of that car. And this is immediately sent onto the, the social media network of a private security company. Um, private security is very important in this context because there's a sense of the state kind of policing systems have failed. Uh, and, and they get followed uh, very attentively by people. Uh, uh, these, the, these kind of uh, warning alerts um, that, that circulate in private security networks. Um, and someone in the crowd identifies that the person in the vehicle who's trying to stop this child escaping um, is specifically a foreigner. And this is, this is highly significant. Okay, so this is going on. Um, uh, the scene then develops. The, the gathering crowd uh, attempt to remove the man from the car. They start rocking the car, and they finally manage to roll it over. Okay, the man then tries to escape from the car and attempts to flee, but the crowd apprehend him and they start beating him and they beat him and kick him to death at that point. Okay. While this is happening, an unrelated person who is not identified at that point attempts to restrain the crowd and to, and, 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 and to stop them um, beating this guy who is clearly in the process of being killed. But the crowd turn on him and beat him to death as well. At, at this critical point. Um, at around that time, the police and ambulance arrive and everything subsides, the crowd disperse. Um, the second man is uh, picked up by the paramedics but soon dies in hospital. Okay? Um, it's at this point that Bukisa Tele, who was buying food for his son, um, returns to find his car on its side and the bloodied body of his of his dead best friend. Um, and, this, and this intersection of these two narratives is, is the kind of thing that, that sticks with me, the kind of thing I don't want to let go of here. Okay, so, so what I want to say about this, um, to talk about this, let's take a step back and talk about how people understand violence. Because to... Because all attempts to intervene in problems of violence, all attempts at violent prevention, violence reduction, are predicated on a pre-existing kind of understanding of, of, of what violence is. And, and, that, and that understanding of what violence is then structures the, what is imagined as possible um, interventions that follow. Um, and one of the interesting things about this area is because violence sort of in imaginary exists as a kind of emotional threat to people, something they, they feel anxious about and scared of. They, th th there's a lot of kind of affective in investment in their thinking uh, about violence. So people, um, particularly in, in high violence societies like that, they think about it a lot and they've got a lot of strongly held beliefs. Um, and those beliefs uh, tend to achieve fairly high levels of social consensus. So there's a, lot of, there, there's a kind of a, a agreement around a common sense. Um, of what kind of um, uh, what kind of thing violence is and how it should be understood and what should be done about it. But there's a second element to that is that that also kind of circulates then in a certain way. It circulates in, in through the media in a way that would be really kind of familiar to to, to people who, who have an interest in criminology, in that. That, 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 that those, those versions and those accounts also depend on, on their circulation. They depend on both circulation through, through news media, through entertainment media, through social media, and also through the kind of uh, everyday dialogues that people have. Okay. And what interests me about this incident is that it doesn't fit with the dominant versions of violence. And I think that's why it disappeared. 
And that's precisely why I want to retrieve it, okay? Because it does a number of things um, that are kind of wrong. Um, the first thing it does is that this is not the normal representation of a, of, of a South African homicide, which is which almost universally represented as, a, as, 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 a, as, as part of the process of a violent crime. That someone is, is, is use, using violence to negotiate uh, appropriation of property from someone else. Okay, that's what it's about. The, the model of mugging, um, hijacking, uh, burglary, um, all, all, all of those are, 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 are what at the, are at the core of the popular imaginary of, of, of violence. And, and in fact, people don't even use the word violence. They only really use the word crime when they're talking about violence because these two concepts are so profoundly conflated that there's no conceptual separation of them. And part of what I'm trying to do is to introduce that concept, conceptual separation and say they're actually two totally different kinds of things. And, and, um, and to understand them at all, that we have to start with that conceptual separation. Um, the other thing, and this is, this is perhaps the most interesting thing, is that the murderers in this case simply fail to slot into the notion of anything like the notion of a, of a criminal murderer. Um, and this is incredibly interesting to me as well. Um, the property crime related violence has a, has a very important function in that the person doing it is a bad person. They are a thief, they're a criminal, they, they, they're someone in the process of doing something bad and then they do something even worse in order to make that bad thing happen. Okay, so they fall, they're very tightly inscribed around the notion of, of, of criminality. And that's why the word crime is totally um, erases the notion of violence as a separate con conceptual category. Now, what interests me in this incident is that these two killings were executed by um, good citizens. These, the, 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 these were concerned citizens acting in the public interest. Um, they, were, they were concerned about the welfare of a vulnerable child, and, uh, and, and, and they acted collectively out, out of that concern. So, th so in no sense are they classifiable within the ordinary the kind, kind of concept, conceptual split of a law-abiding citizen versus a, a criminal. These are, these, are, these are essentially good, well-meaning people doing possibly the best thing one could do in society, which is to try and protect a vulnerable person. Um, and that seems to be what's fundamentally interesting here. Um, the next thing I want to do is to sort of reflect on the way in which their collective action arose out of an interpretation. And, and this seems to be fundamentally important, that any, any kind of reaction to, 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 to notions of violence, as I said before, is predicated on a, on a conceptualization of, of that violence. So, it's worth um, stopping and saying, well, what was that? What was that interpretation? How, how, how did that understanding of this situation come into being? And how is it the outcome of a whole lot of other pervasive, common sense understandings of, of various social moments? And the first thing is clearly what is motivating this, this, this crowd is a background notion of, 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 of child abuse of the, the idea that children get abducted, they get sexually assaulted, um, and, and that one needs to be wary of these predatory people who may seize children, remove them from places of safety, and harm them. Um, so, so this kind of long-standing, and, and it's, it's, a kind of, it's, 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 it's an extraordinary kind of moral panic that has existed now for probably 40 years already, globally, around a, a, a kind of fantasy of like stranger danger to children. Um, it's very, very powerful and it's clearly seizing the imagination of, 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 of this group of people. At the same time, a number of other sort of contextually specific elements have to be in play. Um, one of them is the total breakdown of public trust in the criminal justice system, in the police, in the courts, everything. Um, uh, which is a kind of a fairly realistic assessment of, of the social conditions in, in which this event happens. 
um, there, there, there has been a kind of a uh, breakdown in, 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 in the effectiveness of those organizations even doing what they purport to do, let alone critically assessing what it is they doing in society. And this leads to something else, which I suppose for want of a better word, I've called justice uh, entrepreneurship, is a, a sense that people have to, have to get, get justice together themselves. So they have to mobilize um, the, 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 the social interests themselves, and they have to try and execute um, collective acts of ad hoc justice in order to prevent the society um, deteriorating into a, 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 a kind of chaos. So once again, we see the kind of moral goodwill of these citizens uh, as being a last stand against kind of chaos um, the, uh, the, the, and the general collapse of, of, of society into kind of a mayhem where the strongest survive. Um, so this sort of moral justice entrepreneurship is also at the core of, of what is being assembled here. Um, there's a third element that is quite interesting, which I flagged earlier, which is the specific identification of the man in the car as being a foreigner. Okay. And this is a very, very powerful discourse in South Africa, is the, is the criminalization of black African foreigners in South Africa. Um, South Africa is sort of ranked on um, people who do the kind of empirical studies of these things as the most xenophobic society in the world. And, uh, and the assaults and murders of foreign nationals is literally a daily occurrence. Um, and, 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 and it's normalized um, at very deep level. Um, uh, but once again, that in itself is informed by another imaginary, which is the idea that the foreigners are essentially criminals. So criminal activity is, 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 is totally collapsed into the idea of foreigners. The, so you, you have these kind of tropes like Nigerians are all drug dealers, um, and these circulate very effectively. So the kind of uh, the the the, um, the 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 desire to uphold a kind of uh, moral norms uh, very quickly um, in, meshes in with a with, with the kind of specifically specifically Afrophobic xenophobia. Um, uh, linked to that is not just the idea that that foreign nationals and and this refers only to other African foreign nationals. It, there's no equivalent xenophobia against people from the West at all. Um, uh, are, 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 not only are they purported criminals, but they're also legitimate targets of violence. And one of the reasons they're legitimate targets of violence is because the xenophobia extends to the state and their law enforcement services. So the police will typically not really bother or have an interest in prosecuting or investigating an act of violence against a African foreign national. And, and, and this, this, this creates a kind of a precondition where these acts are, are, are relatively easy to transition into. There's, there's, there's none of the normal deterrence barriers, um, nor are there kind of conceptual, moral, cognitive barriers to, to those kinds of acts. Um, so I think all of that is going on. Um, but the last thing that I think is going on, which is really what my current work is about, and, and a kind of just a horrible book that I've been working on for years now um, is, is really about the, the, the kind of key sort of foundation of all of this, which is the normalization of, of violence in South African society, and specifically the normalization of violence as a legitimate everyday problem-solving strategy, as a, as, as a kind of a, an, an, an acceptable form of social negotiation. Uh, and as soon as you frame the problem in that particular way, you've, you've really gone a complete 180 degree turnaround away from the, the, the kind of criminalization of, of, of violence. The criminalization discourse assumes that there are these kind of moral bad actors who are threatening society from the outside, that they are, they, that, that they are different and one needs to do the work of separating them from society, whereas this analysis kind of takes the opposite view and says, in fact, the transition into everyday violence, even everyday homicidal violence, is, is very much of a piece with everyday life. It is, it, it, it's a strategy that's absolutely integral on every level. So it's, it's, it's a way of raising your children and, and guiding their behavior. It's a way of ensuring outcomes in relationships 
It's uh, very importantly a way of doing politics, of negotiating uh, both between actual political parties by assassination of competing candidates, um, but also uh, politically in a, in, in a kind of structural sense, in that it's a way of doing social process, uh, protest, it's a way of engaging in, um, in, 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 pr in protest around social issues, but also a way of then regulating those social protests with counter-violence. So we typically see things like social protests resulting in like actual assaults on people, uh, buildings being burnt and police retaliating with live ammunition, things like that. Um, so, so that's really what I want to get at, is I want to, I want to kind of save this incident um, as, a, as a case that, that, that helps us not think normally about violence, that not think about violence through the lens of criminality, and instead thinks about violence through the lens of, of, of normal everyday negotiation. Um, and, what's, and, 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 and then it becomes clear how these, these good citizens, these good citizens acting in the in, interests of a vulnerable child, could, could have felt motivated and compelled and justified in using lethal force in order to, 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 pr to protect this vulnerable person. Um, and in that sense, what we see, in, in the, 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 the natural response of the society to this is for that incident to disappear, because nothing can be done with it. It doesn't plug into the kind of um, the, the emotional alert systems are, 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 are about that, that and the way in which people are organized to be freaking out about violence all the time through the kind of conceptualization of these other criminals. Um, and instead, it, 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 it really focuses on this well-motivated, good-intentioned violence. Um, but it also addresses something else. And this is sort of where it's helpful for me to, to draw out a justification for my own work. It's because it didn't only require good intentions. It also required a certain understanding of the situation. Those good intentions were executed with an understanding of what the situation was and how to resolve it. And perhaps the kind of the, 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 the moment in which I, I can sort of save my own contribution to this is 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 with by creating the space um, of 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 stopping that that um, that 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 imaginary of of inserting a possible different conceptualization, and that's why um, I sort of gave this paper a title. Um, from a love story, like the most famous love story, right, Romeo and Juliet, um, and um, this the, the 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 title coming from this the the the, the quote of the friar um, speaking over this, this this kind of destructive love. These violent delights of violence ends and in their triumph die like fire and powder, which as they kiss consume. The sweetest honey is loathsome in his own deliciousness, and in the taste confounds the appetite. Therefore, love moderately. Long love does so. Too swift arrives, as tardy as too slow. And in that quote, what I want to do is go back to what I was rambling about before I started even trying to do an analysis, which is that I don't, I'm not sure um, about what kind of academic conversations I want to be in. Like, I don't feel like properly like a person who wants to have highly specialist conversations with my intellectual peers. I feel more like a person who wants to disrupt um, reality in a certain way, um, which is a different kind of work. Um, and perhaps then, um, the sense that I can make of this is the idea of what does it mean intellectually to be doing the work of slow love? And to stay with that and to say that perhaps I'm not really interested and never really have been interested in violence as a topic. What I've really been interested in is love. Um, and violence only exists as a kind of a barrier, as a disruption, as a failure um, in, 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 in the kind of existential possibility of love, i.e. In the, in the possibility that people can actually effectively protect each other, uh, can, can act in each other's best interest, can identify um, with each other's needs, and, and, that, and that the world can be kind of organized around that. And so perhaps the slowness 
that I'm wanting to introduce into this violent love is the slowness that wasn't there at the moment of this double homicide, okay? That, 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 very, that very rapid concern, the desire to save a child in, 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 in a crisis, um, precisely what was missing there was the ability to hit a kind of stop button, the ability to stop the escalation of that sequence of events, to zoom out from it, and to walk around the thing and ask questions about it, to insert into that kind of intuitive, emotional, already given common sense that leads to an upsurging of emotion, to introduce into that a kind of a pause and a, and, and, and a capacity of critical reflexivity, um, to, just to slow everything down for a while. And in that moment of slowness, to start asking these other questions, to start asking the question, well, what, how did the situation get constructed? Not, not questions about a kind of scientific causality or violence, but, but questions around the, how, how, how these meanings, how these intuitions, how these visceral responses to this moment of crisis actually came to be materialized and actually resulted in the specific outcome. Um, and so, I suppose at the end of the day, this paper isn't so much um, an attempt to explain this specific situation as, as an attempt to, 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 to kind of perform a sort of moral reorientation that saves at its core the fact that there is something valuable in academic work, that there is something intrinsically ethically important about the, 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 the moments of interrupting the, the everydayness of thinking and emotional reaction and, and just opening up a kind of space to, to engage with those processes in a way that slows them down enough to possibly direct them towards different outcomes. And that's it. <laughs>